Colin and Shannon on the program for this uh, Friday. Uh, we uh, hope you all have a um, safe and happy Halloween weekend. Yeah, it's Halloween this weekend. I will be uh, turning off the lights and hiding in the basement. I'm coming over to the house for the expecting to get candy. Well, good luck with that. Yeah, well, I, I'll just keep knocking. You can keep knocking. There, there is no candy. I don't eat candy, and I don't. I'm not buying any candy. Bob, I have no idea what the what the. the Bob, you have so many kids in, in your neighborhood. neighborhood. I have no idea if oh, there are any kids in this neighborhood. I am so disappointed. Well, there will come a time, or there might not come a time. Uh, the news of the day is Kevin Sheveldayov, the general manager of the Winnipeg Jets, um, uh, off the hook with any responsibility for what happened in uh, Chicago. His meeting with uh, Gary Bettman happened this morning, and we will address that situation as well as others with a couple of our pals. Uh, John Forslund is the play-by-play -play voice of the uh, Seattle Kraken, and Darren Millard is um, one of the hosts uh, for broadcast radio and television for the Las Vegas Golden Knights. And not by accident, they are the two most recent teams to join the National Hockey League, and they will join us when we come back after these messages. All right, we're back, and uh, some serious business to attend to uh, before we get to the uh, general levity that this program uh, features on a regular basis. Uh, Darren Millard uh, in Las Vegas with the uh, Golden Knights. And John Forslund, the play-by-play uh, -play voice of the Seattle Kraken, joining us today. Or uh, John, we're going to call we're going to call them thirty-one and thirty-two. That's what we're we're going to just call them thirty-one. It's and like 32. a presidential thing, huh? Well, we <laughs> have Studio Thirty-One in our rink that we do. Well, our, and uh, and Forslund's team is already retired, number thirty-two. Yeah, retired so. a number, raised the raised the banner already. We're good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Shannon, you are team today. You are the news feeder here, so uh, tell yeah. us the news that we have uh, received uh, with regard to the Chicago Blackhawks. Uh, well, what we, what we know today now is that uh, Kevin Chevalier, off the general manager of the Olympic Jets, who was in the organization and in the meeting um, with senior management in 2010, in May of 2010, um, will receive no further punishment from uh, the National Hockey League, will not lose his job, will not be dismissed. Uh, and basically, uh, the reason the commissioner gave for it uh, was saying that Kevin was not in a position of senior management at that point or responsible for things uh, other than the big club. And, uh, and he felt that uh, um, Chevaldeoff was forthcoming and honest and open about uh, what went on. And he didn't feel there was any need for any more punishment. Well, I'm, I'm intrigued by everybody's... Um perception of this i like kevin very much he's been a guest on this program i've talked to him many times in the past he's a good guy um i have no reason to hold him responsible for any of the things that that went on but frankly i thought there would be some punishment here uh millard to you first are you surprised that he gets off uh, scot-free I'm, I think the commissioner read it well. When you look at the at the group that were running the Chicago Blackhawks at the time, you had some uh, very powerful personalities in John McDonough and Stan Bowman and Al McIsaac, uh, Joel Quenville, and uh, Kevin was uh, relatively new to the National Hockey League at the time and would not have had a significant voice uh, in that in that meeting. So, uh, to, if you're if you're going to start uh, holding people responsible based on a level of influence, then uh, Kevin Chevaldeoff would have been well down the list. Now, uh, everybody has a role to play. Uh, everybody has uh, a voice that they can uh, use in, in a situation like that, uh, depending on what you know. And if if we're going to start throwing that around, but there's between the dressing room and trainers and coaching staff, support staff, uh, and so forth, uh, then everybody has to shoulder the blame on, on that part of it. Uh, John Forslund, what do you think? I agree with that. And I also think uh, at some point you have to get to the heart of it. And uh, just as an outsider, I would think the two people who directly could have affected this situation in the immediate uh, case would be the CEO of the team and the head coach who controls right. his locker room and his video coach. And I, I really believe everyone else had a role. Everyone else had a chance to stand up and say something and, and could have since it's a catastrophe that that didn't happen. This is a, obviously a horrible black eye on the game uh, and life in general. But I, I do think at some point, 
uh, this is the appropriate decision because uh, as an outsider, but someone who's been in the game a long time and been in organizations, I would, I would surmise that Kevin had little to do with this other than being involved in the meeting um, because the bottom line would be John McDonough and then Joel, unfortunately, because I think Joel, it's his video coach. And if right. a coach wants to replace a video coach uh, in the morning because he wakes up on the wrong side of the bed, he can do that. So um, that's what I think. But again, we're we're looking at this uh, from a long way away, and um, it's very unfortunate. Yeah, it, it, we we should note that we did, we haven't seen the transcripts, the actual transcripts right. of Kevin's interview with the law firm in Chicago, uh, nor are we we we've just uh, read the release from the National Hockey League and have no no knowledge of you know word for word what the interview was like in, in New York today. Uh, we are I I'm under the impression that. Shovel Dayoff indicated to the law firm during the investigation that he had no knowledge or limited knowledge at the time. Not necessarily that it, he had no role in making the decision. I think that, that goes without saying. I mean, he was pretty low on the totem pole. Right. And there were others above him that could have, should have made this decision from ownership on down, dependent upon when ownership found out about this. Um, so I get that. I'm just a little surprised that there wasn't some punishment, uh, some kind. Of I, 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 I would, I, I, Bob, I, I'll be honest. I, I am too, but obviously something that, uh, shoveled day off, um, and the transcripts, uh, from Tuesday's release, um, and, and the meeting this morning in New York city between Kevin and the commissioner obviously swayed Gary to, to do what he did. Uh, John, just to chime in on that, uh, the easy thing to do here, the expected thing, was to to punish Kevin Shabbatayoff. So uh, I'm I'm with John. There was there's uh, something came to light uh, during the course of that conversation that uh, that made it uh, difficult or uh, opened the avenue for uh, Gary Bettman to uh, bypass Kevin Shabbatayoff for yeah. responsibility. Yeah, and I guess that's my point. It's more surprise. Um, Yep. That there was nothing than, um, than anything else. Uh, we haven't talked much about Joel Quenville's decision to um, resign. Um, is anybody surprised by that? Or was that like, did that become absolutely obvious that this was going to happen? Well, as, as John said, you know, this is a, you know, as far as direct reports, I mean, uh, this young guy reported to, Joel's coaching staff. Joel is in charge. Uh, Joel was aware of it. Kyle Beach made us more aware of that uh, in his interview on Wednesday night. Um, the other mitigating factor is, is that Joel, at a later date, wrote a letter of recommendation for this young guy to work, to work uh, with young people. And, and it was a letter of commendation. So uh, I, in the end, I don't think we should be surprised at all that Joel Quinville is no longer the coach in Florida today. I would say uh, he would probably be left with no choice. Right. Uh, and, and the reason why I would say that is because he, he coached the night before his meeting. And if, if there was a the no brainer and he wasn't, and he wasn't planning on resigning, you, you coach that game. Uh, if you are, and you're, you realize that this is the only Avenue, you probably don't coach that last game, which caused, uh, such an uproar and, uh, and disappointment, uh, in, in the hockey world. Uh, I, I would assume that he was left with no choice in this one. Yeah. Yeah. But it was, he had, he had a choice. He had a choice to coach that game. I think you put it. That, uh, that's what I mean. Correctly. And, and, and he, he obviously felt that he had some chance of getting off or, or some limited well, I, 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 that's responsibility. An I'm not, I'm not necessarily sure of that. Uh, I mean, perhaps he knew he was done and he wanted to have one last coaching job. Yeah. Perhaps. I mean, who knows what, who uh, knows what was going through his mind, Bob? We don't, we don't know. He has to get approval from the national hockey league to take any other coaching job. As down. all these, uh, as all the people who, who are listed, who are in the meeting other than Kevin obviously do. Yeah. Do we think we've seen the last of this group of Bowman and, um, and Quenville at the very least? I mean, is there any chance they get reinstated at some point? Neither of them are young, but both of them are talented. Uh, I don't, I, I, Joel, like Joel's in his sixties. 63. Uh, 
Joel, Joel doesn't need the money. Uh, Joel, well, the interesting, I, I, I would be surprised if we see Joel come back. The interesting thing, Bob, is um, Joel Quenville was a shoe in for the Hockey Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. He was a shoe in for the Hockey Hall of Fame, coaching three teams, doing what he did. Two all time uh, in wins, number two all time. Number two. Yeah. 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 I mean, what does this do to that? Yeah. Well, answer the question. I mean, if you were on the board, would you, can you overlook this kind of stuff? No, you can't. No. You can't. Now, there are going to be people that say, well, hold on, we have convicted felons in the Hall of Fame, and, and Joel Quenville is not a convicted felon. Uh, Joel, Joel, Joel Quenville's, um, uh, I, I want to say, I, I, I want to call it more than a mistake, but Joel Quenville's mistake uh, was one of ignorance. Yeah. Uh, so I, it, it's, it, it will certainly be a discussion point And we, we certainly know at some point that Joel will be nominated to be in the hall of fame and how that is managed at that point will be interesting. Well, the nominations, think, so, sorry, go ahead, John. I just want to, I just think that the key here is what John said earlier. And it's what I can't wrap my head around is how he enabled this individual to continue on yeah. so that he could do this again. That would be the one question I would have, um, you know, why, why would you, why would you do that? I mean, you could basically just, you could have let him go right away or you could just never have anything to do with him again. Why did this happen? I don't know the specifics there, obviously, well, but that's, uh, the, one, but, that's but, the one thing that would tarnish this. Uh, I, I, John, I, the one thing that happened was, is that that group of people led by John McDonough and Joel, and Joel was was obviously in agreement. Put winning the Stanley Cup at a higher priority than than looking after Kyle Beach. That's yeah. that's what happened. Well, I think there's another thing that we should address here, and I, I you know, we got to be very careful, or I'm going to be very careful in, in in how I state this. But at the time that this incident happened, and was conveyed to the management of the Chicago Blackhawks, 2010. The guy they were, that Kyle Beach was pointing a finger at, had no record of sexual abuse that we are aware of. He had no history that we are aware of. And societally, let's be honest, um, at that moment in time, it became one person's word against another person's word. And I'm not excusing, you can't excuse the fact that they didn't do anything tangible about it. 11 years later, it looks like they should have fired the guy right away. And um, probably a police investigation should have been initiated immediately. And we don't know how that would have turned out. But at that moment, it was one person's word against somebody else's word. And we all know that the hockey culture, the sports culture is such that there are priorities given to those who are in certain positions or have been in the game for a period of time. And this was an accusation made by a young man who, to the, if I'm correct, had not played a single game in the National Hockey there, there are priorities given to winning. Winning. Well, I concede that. That's clear. That is an, that's absolutely clear. But here, here, here's what should it, I mean, I, I'm sorry. I, 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 as much as I understand what you're saying, the least of which that should have happened is, is that Brad Aldrich should have been suspended pending an investigation. Pen, you know, okay, let's take this, let's take this accusation seriously. You're and right. Let's deal with it. And I well, think there just should have been an investigation of, of any kind, whether it's in me, in me, and the key word, or whether the key it's word internal. Is, yeah, the key word, Darren, is immediately. Yeah. Not three weeks later, immediately. Well, and we have seen that example of players being suspended and suspended indefinitely, repeatedly in sports for incidents comparable to this. I don't know what is comparable, but well, I mean, um, you got a baseball, you got a pitcher with the Los Angeles Dodgers who has, you know, been suspended for an extended period of time. Look what happened Ray Rice, Ray Rice, same situation, same situation. Yeah. You, you cannot, look, I want to be careful, but um, 
it is sad that it's taken 11 years to come to um, this conclusion. Um, but at least we're there. But is there more? Is there more to come in this? Or, um, I mean, are the Blackhawks, the Blackhawks have already been fined, right, Shani? Yes. Yes. Two million dollars. Two million dollars. Is there more to come for the Blackhawks? Is there something to happen for the ownership family? Directly, uh, the lawsuits no. will 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 cost them. The, yeah, the civil suits will be in the millions. So, but but you know, I I mean I we talked about it with Alan yesterday, Alan Walsh yesterday, Bob. I, I mean, I, I'll be shocked if the district attorney uh, in I guess Cook County doesn't look at this one more time and say, hey, what do we do? How do we do it? How do we manage it? So. And apparently, if I remember correctly, our conversation yesterday with Alan, there are, there's no statute of limitations on they, this. They actually dropped it about 18 months ago. The statute of limitations on sexual abuse was dropped in Illinois 18 months ago. Yeah. No. Yeah. So no getting out of that one. Right. Um, an uncomfortable situation, yeah. but one we had to discuss again. We actually didn't have the boys on to talk about it. So. No. And we're going to talk about other stuff. Um, hopefully a little bit more fun. And we'll take a quick break and come back and uh, do that when we continue after these messages. Bob McCown, it's uh, John Shannon, Darren Millard uh, with the Las Vegas Golden Knights, John Forslund, the play-by-play voice of the Seattle Kraken are uh, with us. That's the quickest commercial break ever, by the way. You're welcome. Stop, 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 stop. Just be a guest, okay? Sorry. You don't know what was inserted there. There were probably... 55 minutes of commercials. That's exactly right. <laughs> That's how popular this show is. And That's you're not huge. helping. I know. I listen. <laughs> or, or, as, or as Doug McLean would say, huge, huge, huge. <laughs> um, well, the two baby franchises in the uh, National Hockey League, 31 and 32, as I guess we're going to call you guys uh, from now on. <laughs> Let's start with 32. Yeah. How's it going out there in, uh, in Seattle? Everything guess going what? according to plan? Yeah, it's raining. How about that? Shocking. <laughs> so th- does that mean you're not peeling the roof back for your next home game? <laughs> no. Uh, it is, um, it's been remarkable in many ways. Um, the people have been fantastic. The fans have been incredible. There's tremendous energy here. Uh, it's great to be part of it. But uh, you know what? I, I've never been to Seattle throughout the uh, job search and interview process and all of that because of the pandemic. So I'm like everybody else. I'm new here. I'm learning about the area. I'm learning about its history. And, uh, and I'm having a lot of fun. But it's, but it's been really good. It's been really good. And I think um, uh, the merchandise sales have been incredible. The facilities are great. The building is a, is a spectacle. It's, it's wonderful. It's everything is advertised. All good. It's a Seahawks any... town. Sorry. It's a Seahawks town, John. Uh, I don't think there's any question right about that. Uh, where do the Kraken and what can the Kraken, how do they fit in? Well, that's a work in progress. It's a great question. And, and you have to earn trust, right? You don't just show up and expect things to be great. And what I like about what's happening now, John, is uh, we're getting to the real stuff. We're getting to hockey games. We're getting to see how the team competes. You know, this has been about the buildup. It's been about rolling out a practice facility, rolling out an arena. It's been about the ownership group and the people that put all the plans in place, the Lightwickies and so on, and all of this. Ron Francis and an expansion draft that leads you to this expectation of what happens next. And then you get to what happens next. And that's when reality sets in. And uh, right now they're starting to come together as a team. They're starting to forge an identity. And in the brief period of time, what I see from the fans inside Climate Pledge Arena is remarkable. And I think they will build an identity as time marches on here. And I think they have the Seahawks, the 12s philosophy, right? The 12th player philosophy um, to lean on a little bit here and say, okay, we're Kraken fans too. And this is what we bring to the table. It'll be a little bit different, um, but it'll be very much the same. There's tremendous passion here. It's a great sports city. Um, it's a city that feels that uh, they, they want more. They've been looking for a winter sports option for a long time, ever since the Sonics left, and now they have it. And they hope to get an NBA team here someday. And uh, you know what? I think they just have to earn their place. I think that's where it is right now. One of the things that um, I've, I know Vegas um, had the, the opportunity to, they looked at a, the, an NBA looked, uh, NBA looked at a, at a team in, in Vegas and the hockey team had the great advantage of being first in. 
And now they have a sister team in the Raiders and who knows may get a baseball team too. So, um, but the hockey team was first in, in a market that was not a traditional hockey market by any stretch of the imagination. And Millard, you know that I know that uh, very well. Uh, In hindsight, Darren, how important was it for the Golden Knights to establish the footprint before the Raiders got there? I think it was huge uh, because you had a city that was known all around the world as a destination city, but didn't really have anything of their own. And they were able to grab onto to something and call it uh, uh, the, the the Golden Knights, and not just a uh, team, but they called it Vegas, which is everybody that lives here calls it Vegas, not Las Vegas. You're you're from Vegas. Uh, they they did it uh, absolutely correctly and and gave them uh, something to to clutch onto. Now the the, the tragedy uh, helped bond the team or certainly earlier on, uh, and then sped up that process. But uh, but beating the National Football League in here. Uh, was key, and I think that it's it's going to pay dividends as far as uh, where the Golden Knights rank within this city for not just uh, the current time, but but for years to come. And that'll go for baseball, and, and if if an NBA team ever ever comes here, uh, it's given them. Uh, it, it will always be the the baby, the first uh, the first child, whatever analogy you want to use. But Darren, I, I'm, I'm curious. It's four years now. You, you have been there. I think this is year three for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and after all your years in Canada where you didn't have to teach one second of hockey vernacular, of hockey history, of hockey period, um, h- how much do you have to do in Vegas or do you have to do any? I don't do a lot on the TV side, probably a little bit more on the radio side, the daily show that, uh, that we do on the, on the flagship station. Uh, but on the TV side, um, we, we don't really uh, base it down. Uh, the odd time I'll get a text from a buddy who will say, Can, like, does, does everybody know what that means? Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm looking at you at being that buddy, uh, John. Uh, but, uh, and, and, and there would be a question that would actually be pertinent uh, if I was working in Canada too, like explain that uh, a little bit more, quit t- taking it so inside the game. But no, we, we, we don't, uh, we don't uh, dumb it down or, or make it more basic uh, for, the, for the Vegas audience any more than, we, than I would, would in Canada. What about you, John? Uh, you know what? I, I agree with all of that. I think it's really hard to go to a hockey one-on-one level a game broadcast because you and your your fans were probably the ones that are in hockey anyway and that's why they're there watching so you got to keep that in mind we did this in north carolina we went through uh conversations about how we were going to do this so you subtly get to points you subtly get to education i think what we're going to do here is we have a pre pregame show which is a half hour before the pregame show which is a half hour before the game and that show the crack and warm up they call it is a softer show that has education marketing uh, initiatives all these different things that the team is about that they can place there the pregame show is about the game and then the game broadcast is a game broadcast but last night uh, JT Brown my partner said something about saucing the puck right so I took that opportunity to explain what he meant by that because I think even some of our, our fans who enjoy hockey might not understand some of the lingo so why not explain it a little bit but you have to be careful you have to walk a line because uh, the last thing you want to do is tick off people who love hockey and follow the game for a long time and there is tradition in seattle this is in virgin territory there's tremendous junior hockey tradition here as you know right and past history we've even put a banner up the other night yeah. right so we've already won the stanley cup I <laughs> oh, guess. hold on so there are anyway. no there are no metropolitan season ticket holders alive still though so I don't don't think, so. <laughs> I don't, they tried to find them you're right there, there are but uh, <laughs> but anyway that it, it's kind of unique that way because every time you, you go to the practice rink or whatever you will bump into people who followed the totems and you know and say they their their granddad you know went to the metropolitan games great granddad whatever the case is so um there is some tradition here. Um, one of the things that um, that I, I noticed in Vegas, and I, I went to several games in the uh, first couple of years uh, when I was in, in Vegas, had the great opportunity, privilege to go and, and see them, even, even in the Stanley Cup final, in, uh, being in the arena. And Millard, I think you will attest to this. What is really shocking about the fan base in Vegas is <laughs> there's a lot of families there are a lot of 
four seat packages with mom and dad and the two kids going to games, a shocking number of uh, something. Of course, those of us from Toronto where it's all, you know, guys in suits or they used to be in suits are, are in the arena, that family core that were attracted to golden Knights games. Uh, and I'm guessing still exists. Correct. That's a great observation. And uh, to, to use the Canadian uh, comparison, like it, it, there's a point where you almost have to be old enough where your mom and dad are going to spend the money for you to go to a game and not run around the concourse and, and do all the things that, that kids normally do at a, at, at a hockey game. But uh, yeah, no, there's, there, it's family environment. And, and I think that speaks to the fact that it's their team. Uh, they, they run a promotion on the, on the scoreboard uh, at, at the, the golden Knights games in, in the third period where it's uh, it, the whole goal of the promotion is to get the tourists to yell at some point, and then the last thing they ask is all the locals to scream and, and applaud. And it's so loud for the, the locals, which just feeds into the, it being the, the Valley's team and, and not uh, something that the casinos are comping tickets to and, and handing out. Sure. But yeah, and, but the, the family part of it certainly does go to that. Have you noticed the same thing, uh, John, in, uh, in Seattle? Uh, is it, are there a surprising number of families going to games? Yeah, a tremendous amount. And uh, I think the key here is that each place will forge an identity, right? So when you go to a game in Las Vegas, you understand where you're at, obviously, but they have done, like, like Darren said, they've done a remarkable job with that Vegas born um, motto and, and kind of bringing that out that, you know, this is what we're all about here, not just the strip. And I think when you come to Seattle, it, it'll be this, it'll be the same situation. Uh, the building, the feel in the building, you'll understand that you're in Seattle. It's just different and um, different in a way that uh, depicts maybe what it looks like over at, at the, the football stadium, you know, the, 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 Yes, it is cloudy here. Yes, it rains. Yes, you're in a building with a where the seats are pitched at a level where the fans are right on top of the rink, and it will be a tough place to play in. And it, you know there'll be Starbucks everywhere. You know, so you'll you'll get all these things that forge your identity. And when you're onto that, you know, in a play in a league where sometimes there are teams that are becoming faceless. You know, this is this is important. So, uh, you know, I really applaud what they've done in Vegas because uh, you understand where you're at when you when you're there as a visitor or if you're a home fan. Well, it, it, and correct if I'm if I'm wrong, but the game presentation person that was in Vegas in year one yeah. is now the game yeah. presentation person in Seattle. That's correct. And so correct. that whole concept of entertainment. And we're going to we're going to supplement what we think are hockey, uh, hockey stories with entertainment is a factor that the Kraken management have really embraced. Correct. Right. And they're even tossing these uh, stuffed salmon into the crowd and three stars. Right. And that <laughs> that caught the players by surprise. They had absolutely no idea when they were handed these things, what was going on. And they had to sign them. And then, you know, the fishmongers at, at the Pike Market, you throw it into the throw it into the crowd. So, yeah. And Johnny Greco is is heading up game presentation. He did a wonderful job there in Vegas. And uh, we're lucky to have him here. Yeah. Hey, hey, you bring up you bring up a really good point about the players and, and, and both of you have I hope have seen enough is how outside of being in the arena how and i know it's covid i know it's different uh, different in, and covid's being handled differently in vegas than it is in seattle too we should note um uh how have the players embraced what they have to do to grow the game in their cities maybe darren you first uh, there's, uh, there's clinics, there's, uh, endeavors, uh, that are led by the players, the endeavors that are led by the, the organization, uh, all, all over in the Las Vegas Valley. Uh, but, uh, but as far as growing the game, uh, uh the players on the Vegas Golden Knights, uh, all it's, it's one of the, they probably have more kids per player. Than, than any team that I know, like Patchetti and and Marchessault, and the, they they've got uh, tons of them. So they're they're around the rink, and they're part of the minor hockey system, and they're in, involved in it. And I think that actually having boots on the ground and being part of the system, uh, Stastny uh, along the way uh, when he played here, uh, I think that's huge in, in, in being able to grow the great game. And Ryan Reeves had, when he was here uh, at ball hockey rinks, uh, uh, it's, it's impressive in how they've ingrained themselves in the, uh, in the minor hockey system. John? I, I'm intrigued by the rivalries of, um, of the two franchises. And John and I don't like each other at all. 
<laughs> Never well, very, very few people like you at all, Millard. So yeah. Yeah. Forslund is um, in, in safe company and a large company too. Um, rivalries are intriguing because um, generally we think of them as geographic. And yet to a great extent, rivalries are developed by confrontation, by significant meetings over the course of um, several seasons. Um, it was presumed, Mr. Forslund, that the chief rival of uh, the Seattle franchise was going to be the Vancouver Canucks because they're a couple of hours up the road. It's early and probably too early to evaluate that. But do you have a sense of that? Is there a franchise that your fan base has, has developed a hatred for right from the get-go? Well, geographically, you're right. It's Vancouver. And they, they all believe that this will develop into a rivalry. But I'll preface this by saying that I do despise Millard. And I will say, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I will say that um, I think Vegas will become a rival because it's an expansion rivalry. And it's they've heard, you know, about their great success over and over again here. Can you pull off what Vegas has pulled off? And you know what? Uh, the, the opening game was a pretty exciting game. You know, the Vegas jumped out to a big lead and the Kraken somehow built a game, ended up losing that game, but it was a, it was a good hockey game. And it was, it was kind of an, a little bit of an eye opener of what this could look like. So yeah, in this division where everything appears to be up for grabs for a variety of different reasons, um, I would say the obvious one is Vancouver, but I think Vegas and Seattle are going to develop a very good rivalry here on a variety of fronts, you know, on, off the ice, marketing, social media, going back and forth. Um, there, there's a lot of things that are in play here. And I think it's intriguing. Yeah. Every time they play, that'll be a storyline. And that game one, John was a big part of it uh, for, for the Vegas side was protect the legacy of the right. great, like winning your first game and, and getting onto a great role. And they didn't want to give up an inch to the Seattle franchise, uh, to the Kraken uh, on that side of it. Hey, John, uh, Seattle has now won two consecutive games at home. Mm -hmm. We're always, we, we hear that, uh, you know, we know that Vegas crowds are loud. What, what was it like at the end of the game when they beat Minnesota the other night? Incredible. And in the Montreal game, I, I just let them go. I let the game breathe, which I think you like me to do. Um, <laughs> you make, you make it sound like I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here judging you all the time. No, 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 no. Far from it. Um, but you know what? I, I love to do that in playoff games. I love to let the crowd take it home, but they have to deserve it, right? You just can't fabricate that. So I felt it. And if you can feel it upstairs, you know, it's real. And I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to be a kid here for my new team. I'm being as honest as I can be. The atmosphere is incredible. Uh, the surge on the first goal against Vancouver on opening night when Vince Dunn scored, it, it blew the roof right off the place. And it was just, it was just incredible. So the fans are engaged. And oh, we're having some trouble with uh, John's um, connection. It might, I, I might've done that because he said something mean about me. Well, well, so let me ask you, Darren. I mean, the expectation of this team that, that you cover, um, it's tough now after you go to the Stanley Cup final in year one. It's tough. And how do they manage that? And, and is, there, is there any chance that people get um, disappointed in what, the, what the, the Knights do if they don't get to the third round, if they don't get to the playoffs? Yeah. But I think that's good in, in a sense because it makes you uh, a professional sports franchise, not just a hockey franchise, but a professional sports franchise. There's expectations to win. And when it starts, this isn't just the fans that have expectations or would be disappointed. It starts with Bill Foley and uh, George McPhee and Kelly McCrimmon and, and on down. Now, um, are, are the expectations uh, for a fourth year, now fifth year franchise uh, out of uh, skew from like what, it's easy to draw the parallel to the Toronto Maple Leafs. Like the expectations for Vegas to, to win a Stanley cup. Are you serious when Toronto hasn't won around in, in 15 years, the, there is that uh, default, but uh, I, I don't think that, uh, that anybody would argue against that, uh, that the ultimate goal here is to win a Stanley cup this year. Rob, I talked to Robin Leonard this week on the other podcast that I do. And he said, it's, it's to win a Stanley cup. Bill Foley said at the start of the year, it's to win a Stanley cup. So uh, if they're saying it, then I don't think it's wrong for the fans to expect it. 
Well, I could be 100% wrong, but I think hockey fans in mature hockey markets follow other teams closer than they would than Vegas fans would. And I think initially Seattle fans that the focus in your two cities are going to be on your team. I think that's very Canadian, Bob. I really do. I think that's very Canadian. Well, Having lived might... in both countries and worked in both countries, I think that attitude is very Canadian. Well, you don't think that a, a, a mature... Um, Ranger fan? Ranger fan, Bruins fan. You don't, you don't think that they watch what, what's, what's going on in a generic sense? I, I think our tell... sport's regional. Uh, I, I think the moment the Bruins or the Rangers are out of the playoffs, yeah. they no think problem. hockey season's over. Yep. And that has been one of the major issues. And I mean, I, I can tell you over my time, whether it was at the league or talking to these guys, that's one, one of one of my biggest bones to pick is that even the teams start to think that way. And that's 100%. a problem, you know, hundred percent. Can you change I've, that? I mean, I, I've, I've heard that from team marketing people and management people. Hey, nobody cares. Once, yeah. once a team's eliminated, and I, I, I don't know how you how you're successful with that mindset, but that's just me. Maybe it's because I love hockey and I watch it to the end. But they seem people seem to watch the World Series and the Super Bowl, don't they? So what's I understand why they don't, but maybe they should. I don't know. I, we, I, uh, I, we dedicate one segment uh, in our the radio show uh, to league news. We call it one timers, uh, but it's news and notes from it's it's about twenty minutes long, fifteen minutes long. And we just try to talk about other stories and make it that that storyline. So when other teams come to town, you know a little bit about what's going on yeah. in the league. But it's it it's become a conscious decision to do that. It doesn't happen organically. You, you know, you, you, we we talk about in our game, and uh, John mentioned how good social media is with clubs. But you watch the moment a team disappears from the playoffs with the focus of their own social media system. They don't even, and this is a, a small issue, but they don't even retweet where the games are on the networks when they're coming into their market. If it's, if, for instance, if it's Carolina and the Hurricanes are out, you know, the, the Carolina Hurricanes Twitter account, which is a very good Twitter account, doesn't promote that Tampa is playing Florida in the playoffs, which right. is which is absolutely Absolutely yeah. ridiculous. I remember Never sitting. That. I, 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 I and I, and here's the thing. I don't think the teams have either. I don't think the teams have. I think they got their blinders on. I think they don't care about anybody else, and they have forgotten the greater good. It's like I mean, if my local McDonald's, if my local McDonald's is closed, which by the way would be a national tragedy in my house, if if my local McDonald's was closed, the sign would say the nearest McDonald's is three blocks down. It wouldn't say we're closed. We don't care where you go. And that's the same attitude that every team, the new team and the new team should be the, the teams like Vegas and teams like Seattle. And I'm sorry to get on a soapbox should be pushing this more than ever because it helps you grow your fan base, right? It helps you grow uh, your fan base 365 days a year. You know, hockey's not over when the crack and lose in the final. Oh, maybe right. it is. Yeah, maybe it is. But just, <laughs> wait, wait, well, hold on. You now you got my attention. Well, the cracking, cracking well, I mean, the final. No, that, that, that impacts me a little bit. Hold on, isn't that isn't that part of the rules that an expansion <laughs> team has to go to the Stanley Cup final? Isn't that Apparently. a rule? <laughs> I would love if if they met in the playoffs. Oh my oh, gosh. What, what do you think would happen there? <sighs> well, you'd love you know what? Here's what had happened. You would according to, to Shannon, uh, uh Las Vegas would would love it, and um people in Seattle would love it. And the rest of America would go to sleep. That's right. And California with three teams wouldn't talk about it for a second. Yeah, and that's wrong. the that's and that's wrong. And that's a problem. That's a problem we have right. as a league. Well, I right. mean, there used to be a thing. Um, I hate to bring up the Chicago Blackhawks, especially at this time, but there used to be a thing that's where somebody said there are forty thousand Blackhawk fans, yeah. and half of them go to the games. Yeah. And um, and that's it. And Chicago is one of the biggest markets in North America. So, I mean, is there any way to calculate what percentage of, um, of people in Seattle and Las Vegas actually have or are becoming fans of the hometown teams? As well, a I'll just go with minor hockey uh, participation. Bob uh, here was in the hundreds 
uh, when well, it basically hockey and, basically did not exist before the. Yeah. the gold and race. now there's uh, two more rinks, four more pads, and uh, minor hockey's into the thousands. And there's traveling teams, and there's uh, girls hockey, and families involved. And that's to me the the fans in the rink uh, in the first couple of years are it it's great, it's amazing. But you when people start getting involved in the game and they're understanding the game, and then the kids are the next generation of the game. That's when you get the uh, the stability in the marketplace. Well, and Seattle has, as we've talked about, Seattle has yeah. a much deeper history in the sport. Two junior teams, one in, one in, I think it's in, in Renton or Bellevue, John, which one, where is oh, it? The, the, the Thunderbirds are in Kent. Oh, in Kent. And, okay. And, and, and then Everett. Is, and then teams. Everett. Yeah. Right. Everett. right. But I mean, we played in Spokane and that was the first preseason game. They sold $900,000 worth, worth of merchandise at that game. Nine hundred thousand dollars worth of merchandise. So, yeah, there is tradition, and there is a little bit of a leg up from a virgin area like Raleigh and like Las Vegas, but you have to enrich it too. And I think there's there's the the rinks have to be uh, replenished here. Uh, there has to be significant money dumped into the community, and and what the Kraken are attempting to do is dump some of that money into areas and and cultures that need support to play hockey. Um, we're, we're becoming a, a sport for the elite. That's unfortunate. That's the way it is. And, and that's a big problem. And so they're going to at least try to address that from the, from the ground floor, from the beginning. And that's why the practice rink is, is called the community ice plex because it's about the community. And I think much of it will emanate from there with the three, three brand new sheets of ice and all these new learn to play programs there. But Darren's right. The grassroots and John, that gets to your point. If you get parents involved and kids involved, they're the ones that may stay to the end to watch the cup final because they love the game. That's I the way so. to get to it. But I it's a big, so. it's a big problem because the teams are not still on board with this. And I agree with you completely. Uh, I don't know where we're going when you have that kind of mentality. Yeah, it's funny. It's funny. You mentioned Spokane uh, as a guy who grew up five hours from Seattle and four hours from Spokane. Spokane's a better hockey town. hundred percent. Spokane. There, that is a mature, knowledgeable fan base for hockey in Spokane, Washington. Right. I mean, they've done a magnificent job there with, with their junior hockey program. I mean, this was a town that the, the, the passion for hockey was, this is where Tyler Johnson, who plays in Chicago now grew up. His family were so such advocates for the game. They would drive nine hours to Vancouver for Tyler to play. Yeah. I mean, uh, the, Spokane is a, a really neat hockey market. And yeah. I, I, you almost wonder, and I know that the, the Kraken put their American League team. It's going to Palm Springs. Palm Springs, come on! You're, we're gonna we're gonna send you to the minors, and you're going to Palm Springs. Seriously? Yeah, too bad. Yeah. yeah. You um, know who never likes that the most? Up. Never, <laughs> never come back. Never come back. <laughs> yes, How right. about the the scouts trip going <laughs> from Palm Springs to Henderson in, oh, in Vegas yeah, know, uh, for, to cover the AHL? They're my, pretty my, happy. My, 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 never come back. Yeah, <laughs> my, my point is, is it probably would have made more sense from an America league perspective to put the team in Spokane, but it would have really, it might've cannibalized what the, what the Western hockey league junior team has done there so well. Yeah. And Scott sure Carter was. would not be happy with us. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, last, last question before we wrap this up, we're t- time is our enemy a little bit here, but it is not inconceivable that two NBA franchises will be awarded in the foreseeable future. And it's also not inconceivable that they will go to Seattle and Las Vegas. And it is also not inconceivable that the Oakland A's wind up in Las Vegas. I mean, all these things are on the table and, and feasible. Give me your perspective of how that might impact the hockey teams in your two markets. John, do you first? That'd be an interesting one, right? Because they just honored uh, Lenny Wilkins last night and they named a street after him. It was his birthday and, you know, all of that the building is prepped out for it. I mean, there is an mm-hmm. NBA room that's not being used and, and facilities that are not being used by anyone, but they already, they already got it all plumbed out and ready to go. So um, uh, when that happens, it'll be interesting because uh, people really are still very remorseful and bitter about the supersonics leaving. If they come back, I, I think they take a little bit of the thunder. And that, that's why it's important that the Kraken get a hold of it here, get a hold of it early. And like I said at the top, earn the trust of this fan base, be real and be, a, you know, tickets are expensive. They're all sold. 
which is all good, you know, in the honeymoon period, but you got to retain those people. And the last right. thing you want, to, and the last thing you want, Bob, is no shows. You don't want to see that because that's even worse uh, because people are just saying, well, we, we can afford the tickets. We're just not going to go. Um, and that's here because there's a, there's a lot of money in this market. So um, I, I think it'd be great. You know, that's the, that's the fluffy answer, but I think it would be a challenge to, to have an NBA rival in this city, but I think they're ready for it. And I think they expect it. So uh, I guess uh, more is better. As a former Las Vegas, I can tell you, um, I was there when the only show in town was the UNLV run and rebels. And it was a pretty good show. Mm -hmm. um, they were they winning though. Win they, they were they winning were, when they were winning. Yeah. Uh, when Tark was there, when they won a national championship, that was the era in which, where, where I lived in Vegas and, mm -hmm. um, it was the show and it was the story day in, day out. And even though the college basketball season only lasts three or four months, it was the story 12 months a year. What happens if an NBA franchise moves into Vegas, Millard? Uh, can I just say that I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, they, they've got their summer league and they're very protective of that. And it, they, they've got other markets that, that are, have had in the NBA like Seattle, uh, so I, I'm, I'll just start it off with, I don't think the NBA necessarily is a no brainer, uh, to come to, to Vegas. Uh, and, but, but saying that whoever wins, Bob, it, this is, this is a, a town that's very, very, uh, traditionally following the front runners. And if you win, you will do great. If you're not winning, uh, you're going to have to do everything you can to, to sell tickets. Now, fan base and, and growing the game and the generational, that's going to take a while to, to fill in on the hockey side. So it's important to, to keep on, on winning. Uh, baseball comes here. MLS will probably be next uh, for Vegas. But mm -hmm. uh, I think baseball comes to Vegas before the NBA. And uh, I think the NBA goes to Seattle before anything. Well, well, I t I tell you what, did you, by the way, did you, when you mentioned the fact that uh, two more professional sports teams are coming to cities that these guys live in, couldn't you see their, their eyes light up and say, wow, maybe there's more work for me. Couldn't you see that? Both of no, them were saying, I, I better I saw, hold my, I saw, I yours, hold my I saw your eyes light up wondering whether there might be work for you eventually. But I, I think those I've been practicing my, my, it's a cross to the, to the keeper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Keep practicing. I, I, I wonder who taught you that. That was good. <laughs> uh, guys, um, it's early days in the season and early, early days for the uh, Seattle Kraken. Uh, you know, we wish you guys the best of luck and uh, your teams all the best. And uh, we'll stay in touch. Well, you know, maybe we'll do this somewhere later in the year and see how things are going between these two franchises and whether you've developed a sincere hate for each other. If we do this oh, again, can you guys there. put up some pictures in your respective uh, oh, studios have, or locales? I have, picture, I have pictures. Oh no. yeah, you have great pictures. You have yeah. multiple. You have more TVs than these guys have pictures on their walls. I don't know. I don't know who who's Forslund's interior decorator is, but I'd fire it's, them. It's so. McCowan's. Uh, Millard, <laughs> send, send me an eight by ten, and I mean eight foot I, by ten foot picture of yourself. I do have a portrait. I do have a portrait of Bob in the closet here. But <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> There's uh, darts in it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to hang the eight by 10 picture Millard. I'm just, I'm going to take it out to the fireplace. I need some kindling. Oh. Uh, we, we got to get out of here. Thank you, boys. Uh, we'll talk you. down the road. Um, See you guys. Darren Millard, John Forslund. We'll come back and wrap it after these messages. As always, we uh, take a second to thank uh, Millard and Forslund for uh, joining us on the program today on both a serious and not so serious level of conversation. Well, unfortunately we have too many serious ones these days, Bob. We do. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say this is serious, but the Toronto Maple Leafs today announced that they'd come to an agreement with their number one best defenseman, mm -hmm. uh, a seven, I don't know, seven and a half or 7.75, something like yeah, that. Yeah. Eight, but a full eight year deal with Morgan Riley. What do you make of that? Well, uh, remember when we had Kyle on, what was it? about six weeks ago, Bob, we, we asked him what was going to happen here. And um, I mean, I, th and when, when all the other players signed contracts, other defensemen signed contracts, they were in the nines, you know, Seth Jones in the nines, Darnell nurse in the nines, Charlie McAvoy in the 9 million range, Kale McCarr pretty close to that. Um, you, you know, Morgan Raleigh, in my opinion, took a hometown discount uh, to stay with the Maple Leafs and play in Toronto. Uh, and, uh, now it'll be interesting because this contract 
comes into effect next summer is how does the Maple Leaf management, how do they maneuver the salary cap to make sure it still fits by next year? You rattled off a number of names of defensemen who got contracts that start with a nine. Mm -hmm. Is Morgan Riley as good as all those players? I don't think so. But that, well, that, and that's my observation. He's uh, very close. Yeah. But he but, shows moments where he looks like one of the best defensemen in, in the NHL. But there are, there are issues. <laughs> but, but history shows you in the National Hockey League is the biggest contract a defenseman signs is the last one. <laughs> so, you know, the, 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 you know, Seth Jones set the bar. Then that, 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 you know, that rose, Darnell Nurse's dollars, that Rose McCarr's dollars, that Rose, you know, McAvoy's dollars, and you wondered if it would do what it would do for Riley, and it didn't do near as much for Riley. Well, but an apples to apples comparison, I'm not sure that um, Morgan Riley would be, you know, yeah. is he taking a hometown discount? Oh, I think so. I think so. I, I don't know. You know, I, I mean, I, I and, and here's the thing they, they did not want to risk it for next summer. They did not want to wait until oh, next well, summer. I, I, you know, the grass is always greener. That philosophy exists in sports everywhere when it comes to free agents. Somebody on, on another, in another organization will overpay for somebody else's product mm -hmm. and especially a defenseman. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, that's right. So yes, he could have got more if he, if he'd gone to free agency. I don't question that. I'm just maybe, maybe questioning whether he took a home, a significant hometown discount, whether this guy actually is a $9 million hockey player. But we'll never know the answer to that now. Um, whether this is the last contract that Morgan Riley signs will, will be re remain to be seen. He'll hmm. be mid-30s by the time this right. is, is done. Right. And who knows whether he continues to play after that. We must be off. Time is our enemy. Uh, again, our thanks to Millard and Forsland for joining us. Have yourself a nice weekend, Mr. Shannon. And we'll uh, see you on Monday. You too, Bob. That'll do it for us. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Have a nice weekend. Goodbye, everybody.